Everyday life can often seem mundane when you long for something interesting to happen. However, you may get more than you bargained for if something horrific befalls you. Here are 20 horror stories that are sure to give you chills with my good friend, Killer Orange Cat. So get comfortable and let the darkness take control. Number one. Four years ago, in my freshman year of college, me and a few friends went to check out the haunted bridge in town. It was in the woods over a creek right behind a shopping center. The story goes that multiple people had died on the bridge over the years and that the ghost of a man who died arguing with his wife haunted the bridge. We get to the bridge and it's about 20 feet above the ground. Having to walk up a steep hill to reach it and it had steep drops to the side. We go across the bridge and walk about a hundred yards down the roads past it and nothing happened. So we turn around light-hearted as it seemed to be a hoax. As we turn and start making our way back, we all start hearing very heavy and loud footsteps in the woods right next to us. The creepy part was that they stopped when we stopped walking and started back when we did. My friend yells, hey, loudly, thinking that it would scare off the animals following us but nothing happened. We make it back to the edge of the bridge and could hear it in the woods just below the hill. I was carrying a small 38 special in case of hobos and called out, I have a gun, leave us alone or I'll shoot. At that moment, all of the trees blew as if a strong wind of gust came and a voice louder than anything I've ever heard screamed at us. We all promptly sprinted to our cars and sped away to the Waffle House and figured that we just had an encounter with a ghost. Number two. This encounter happened to my mom and she was in middle school in the early 70s. Her family lived outside of town, so she rode the bus to and from school. She was in the 6th grade and had a boyfriend who also rode her bus. They would sit together and hold hands, but they were not inappropriate with their interactions. The bus driver took notice of their relationship and started to make comments to them. He'd ask if they kissed a lot, if they tongued, and once even asked him if he sniffed her underwear. Not knowing what to do, they just did their best to ignore him. On the last day of school, the bus route went as usual, except that the driver skipped my mom's house. When he stopped at the next house, several miles away, she tried to get off the bus with that girl. The kids all knew each other pretty well and were friends. The driver stopped her and made her go sit back down. Every stop after that, she tried to get off of the bus and he'd tell her to go sit back down until she was the last one left on the bus. She was already terrified and crying. She has said that she didn't remember if she was praying out loud or not, but she remembers just begging for an idea of how to get away. The driver told her to move to the front of the bus, right behind his seat. On her way, she set her books and things in the middle of the aisle, hoping that if he came after her, he would be slowed down. He finally started back down her road towards her house, but turned off onto a dirt road leading back to some brush. She finally decided that if he even slowed down enough, she was going out the back emergency door and running for it. As he turned onto another dirt road, deeper into the brush, she happened to glance out the back window to see her dad and her older brother, he was an adult in their truck, following behind. She shouted up to the driver, You'd better stop this bus right now. That's my dad behind the bus. 
he stopped the bus and opened the doors for her to get off. But she was too scared to move. Within a few seconds, her dad was on the bus, standing right up next to the driver so that she could walk around behind him. He told her to go get in the truck with her brother. As she sat in the truck, she could see her dad through the back window of the bus, just going off on this guy, verbally, unfortunately. And when her dad got back into the truck, he hugged her like never before, and she just lost it crying. She knew that if her dad was scared, she'd just escaped with her life. Now, this wasn't just a coincidence that her dad had found her. Every kid who got off the bus after they missed my mom's stop had gone home and told their parents that the driver wouldn't let her off the bus and that she was really scared and crying. The parents all called my grandparents to let them know the stories that they were getting. My grandparents never reported the incident to the police or the school. But they did talk to the owner of the bus company, and they never saw that guy driving again. My mom believes that they didn't report it to the police, because her dad had threatened the driver's life, and he would in turn report that to the police. My grandfather went to his grave, without ever revealing what he'd said to the bus driver. Several years later, my mom was talking with her mother-in-law, Grandma C, about Grandma C's cousin, who was married to a guy from my mom's hometown. Grandma C was telling her that this guy was in prison for impregnating his 14-year-old stepdaughter. As an off-the-cuff remark, she mentioned that he used to drive a school bus in the district where my mom went to school. My mom almost passed out at this news. She asked his name and was given the name of the bus driver who abducted her all those years ago. I know. I feel the same way, that they should have said something to the police and had him arrested long before he found another potential victim. I believe they made a mistake in that regard. I'm glad the perp ended up in prison, though. Number 3 On one occasion, I was standing in the kitchen washing dishes when I glanced up at the window in front of me. It was night and the window had no curtains which always creeped me out, so I could see the reflection of the doorway behind me. At that moment, I saw a cat-like shape slink around the door frame. A few seconds later, the familiar bump against my legs, but when I turned to pet my cat, nothing was there. I figured. It was just one of my old childhood cats that had come to visit. Anyway, I was just settling into bed one night and I felt my cat jump on my bed and snuggle against my side. Again, I went to pet her but as my hand descended, there was an absence. Nothing was there. I then heard the cat door swing downstairs. I was confused but assumed she'd bailed on cuddles and went to go play outside. Immediately after the swinging cat door, my cat came charging in, wet from being outside in the rain as normal. And I realised she'd never been inside to begin with. This was a few weeks after my kitten had died, so it was comforting to think that maybe he was just checking up on us. Number four. So, when I was in elementary school, one of the boys a few grades ahead of me was Kyle Dubay. I was two or three grades below him, so I didn't have much contact with him outside of recess. In the four square line, he often made it a point to stand right behind me and yank on my pigtails as hard as he could, whipping them under the pretense that I was a horse and he was riding me. He also used to bring knives to school, and would sometimes threaten some of his classmates with them when they did something to make him angry, and at one point actually pulled one on a girl, after school, out behind the school. Why nothing was officially done about it, I don't know, but my school, being very small, was not known for being on top of the disciplinary side of things. 
There were a number of small things, the hair pulling and just the general way he acted, that led to my being very uncomfortable whenever he was around. I wasn't alone in this regard. Former classmates have also expressed feeling uneasy in his presence. To my relief, he ended up moving away, and none of us heard anything from or about him for a number of years. Until one day, he shows up on the local news, having been arrested for the murder of Nicole Cable. He made a fake Facebook profile, lured her out of her house, kidnapped her, duct taped her, and left her in the back of his dad's pickup truck. His intention was to pretend to find her and be the hero. When he went back and found that she was dead, he dumped her body in the woods and covered it in sticks. They found her about a week later. I was in school when I read the article, and I had to go to the nurse's office because I felt so weak, sick, and shaky. It's very disconcerting to think a murderer used to yank on my hair. He was sentenced to 60 years in prison. Number 5 I had to attend a family reunion a few years ago. Unfortunately, I really didn't have the money to fly, nor the money to stay in a hotel on the way. So my plan was to drive the entire way and sleep at rest areas in my car. It made sense to me, as it would ensure that I would be able to visit my relatives. It was a three-day trip, so I would be sleeping in the car for at least two nights. I brought along some pillows and blankets, so that I could curl up in the back seat. The first night came and went with no incident. I found a rest area, and was able to just hang out in the parking lot. The second day of driving, however, had me going through the mountains. I had never made this trip before, so I wasn't sure if I would find a rest area. I drove for a very long time, and when my eyes were beginning to close, I figured I would just have to pull out on the side of the road to get a little rest. It was much harder to go to sleep this time, but at least it was quiet and dark. Very few cars actually came across. I'm not really sure how long I had been asleep for, before I felt something wake me up. I thought my car had moved a bit, but then I assumed it was probably just something I felt when I was sleeping. I closed my eyes, and then I felt it again. My car bobbed up and down a bit, I was afraid. Peeking out from under the blankets, I caught sight of someone standing at the front of my car. He had his foot resting on the bumper, and it was he who was pushing it down with his foot, causing my car to bob. I was about to hide back under the blankets when I looked to the side window and saw a second person there peeking into the side window. I jumped, and when I did, I saw the first guy leave the front of the car and come around to the side window where I was. He viciously tried opening my door, which fortunately was locked, and then started banging on my window. I was completely freaked at this point and decided that the best thing to do would be get into the front seat and start to drive. Right before I started the car though, the first guy succeeded in busting in my window. I yelled, but then quickly pulled away. I have no clue why those guys were antagonizing me, but I did not stop driving until I got to the reunion, and I have never slept in my car again. Number 6 This happened when I was 6 years old. It was winter, and close to Christmas and was lightly snowing outside. I couldn't sleep, and was sitting on the couch with my mom, while my dad was in a recliner across the room. It was about 10 p.m., and we were watching TV when there was a loud knock on the front door. 
My dad looked over at my mom and said, Who the hell is knocking this light? My dad got up and looked out the window and said to my mom, There is a guy standing out there. My mom said not to open the door, but my dad decided to anyway. When my dad opened the door, there was a man standing there, uh, approximately in his 60s. Now remember, it's winter time. The man had no coat, no hat, no gloves. He wore only a tank top undershirt and jeans, and he had no shoes on. My dad said the man looked like he had blood on his shirt and his hands. This man didn't say anything when my dad opened the door, so my dad said, Can I help you? The man stared blankly at my dad and said, Please call the police. I just killed my wife. My mom heard this and screamed, and it scared the shit out of my dad. He slammed the door and locked it and immediately called the police. The police were there in about ten minutes. My dad opened the door and let them in and explained everything that happened. The police then went outside and searched all around the house. A few minutes later, the police came back in the house and asked my dad if he was joking around. My dad told them again what happened. My mom said the same thing. I even told them what I saw. This is what the policeman said. We can't find anything outside. No footprints in the snow. No car tire tracks. No blood. Nothing at all. It hadn't been snowing hard enough that it would have covered any tracks that quickly, or hidden any blood in the snow. This was a man that we had never seen before, and my dad said there was no car outside. My parents and the police never did figure out what happened. But both my parents still talk about this story to this day, and it's been over 30 years. Number 7 My wife and I bought a house in 2011 that had been vacant for 13 years. It was built in 1985, and we were the third owners. I don't know about the pet history of the previous owner, but anyway, we've had people over periodically that sometimes ask if we have a cat. I'd never seen anything myself until about a month ago. For the first time ever, I saw something out of the corner of my eye whilst I was in the office. It was very quick, but distinctly looked small and stealthy, just like a cat. But more importantly, just two weeks ago, I finally saw it for the first time. I was in the kitchen, and my daughter was in the living room. I could see the living room from the hallway in the kitchen. I was looking down at the island getting myself a snack and she came into the hallway and was heading directly towards me. I looked up at her and right in front of her was a black and white cat scurrying to get out of the way. I blinked and it was gone. So it was only an instant but I definitely, definitely saw a cat. It was pretty cool. We've never felt it or heard it, but I'm pretty stoked that I've actually seen it. I don't mind having a ghost cat. In fact, I kind of like it. Number 8 This is the third and most terrifying experience I've ever had with the paranormal. This was when I was stationed on the ship and I was assigned to take an inventory of the products we have in the bottom of the ship, which is the freezer of frozen goods. Now mind you, I am alone, and the freezer is enormous, almost covering the entire bottom of the ship. There are also so many items within the freezer, that sometimes stock are piled up on the ground, and we have to climb over, squeezing between the ceiling of the room and frozen boxes. I have a large coat on, so at this point in time, I'm sort of warm and still freezing at the same time. I'm Hawaiian grown, so I'm not used to the chill. Just thought I'd add that since 
I know some people are used to the cold. Not me, though. Okay. So I'm taking inventory of the items in the freezer. When I hear footsteps behind me, and thinking it's one of my co-workers, I just ignore it and continue with my work. I start to think about it and realize that the footsteps are lighter than my usual large and heavy steps my co-workers make. I turn around and see this little girl in a polka dot dress looking up at me. At this point in time, we are stationed at shore, and the ship regularly schedules tours of the entire vessel, so I think she just got lost, and ask her, Hey, sorry, but you're not supposed to be here. She looks like a normal little girl between the ages of seven and eight, or around there. She doesn't say anything but she just keeps looking at me. I start to get nervous and ask her if she'd like to go back to her parents. So I reach out to hold her hand when she just starts kind of walking, but speed walking. It's hard to explain. If you ever watch the movie Gothica, it's the scene where the ghost walks slowly and then speeds up, and then slows down, and then speeds up again. She does this, and goes further into the freezer, and I completely freak out. No human being should be able to make those sort of movements. I book it out of there, and run up the ladder, well, like my life depended on it. I was fumbling like it was nobody's business. I rushed to my supervisor who was just watching the other workers doing their business and I tell him what happened. He begins to tell me that there were no tours being conducted during that time and he looks completely unshaken despite my freaking crazy story. He sits me down and tells me the event of when an officer brought his family to the ship to show them around. The officer's daughter fell down the steep ladder, well, and died. He said that people sometimes see her down there. I said, fuck that shit, I'm not going back down there on my own. Needless to say, I was always with two other people when I went down there again. Number 9 I went to boarding school as a child. My family is pretty well off, and they always tried to make it seem like sending me to a boarding school was best for my education. I honestly thought it was best for them to avoid parenting as much as possible. If I sound bitter, I'm really not. For the most part, I really enjoyed boarding school. However, there was one year, when I was 12, that I didn't have a very positive experience there. There was this guy in my grade who was a bit of a bully. He was the type that goes to a really good school, and you almost wonder how he even got in. Now if that makes me sound like I'm bitter, it's because I am. His name was Scott, and he made my life a living hell for a short period of time. Whenever he saw me, he would push me, poke me, prod me, call me every name in the book. I really didn't know why he singled me out for this sort of torment, because I was definitely not a nerdish or bookish type, but there was just something about me that he didn't like. Our interaction probably would not have gone past just normal bullying, if it hadn't have been for one incident in particular. I was walking on the grounds between classes. It had been raining and the ground was really wet and mushy. I was in a bit of a hurry to get to class. 
when I suddenly tripped over something and fell face first into a large puddle of mud. I was covered in wet sludge. I turned over and saw Scott there. He was laughing his ass off, as if he had seen the funniest thing in his whole life. I couldn't go to class all messy, and knew that I had to go back to my dorm room to change my clothes. I would of course be late for class, and would likely get demerits for it. Pissed beyond belief, I grab a handful of mud and hold it right in Scott's face. Getting up, I kicked him hard in the crotch. He crumpled to the ground, cursing at me. He was threatening the hell out of me too. The problem was that in his current condition, he really wasn't able to do much. After that event, I didn't even mind the fact that I was late for class. I felt really good about standing up for myself. It was quite short-sighted though. I honestly thought that my problems with Scott were completely over. That night I returned to my dorm and the lights were out. I saw that my roommate was lying in his bed, so I decided not to disturb him. I came in, undressed, and decided to get some rest myself. I got into bed and dozed off. A little while later, something awoke me. I wasn't sure what, but something definitely had. I looked around the room and saw my roommate was sitting up in his bed looking over at me. I asked him if something was wrong, but he didn't respond. He just sat there looking at me. After a moment, he waved me off and lay back down on the bed. I thought it was weird, but didn't think too much of it and dozed back off. The next time I woke up, it was because I felt someone nudge me. I opened my eyes and saw Scott leaning over me. My eye shot over my roommate's bed and it was empty. I was going to yell but Scott put his hand over my mouth and pressed really hard against it. He then took out a pocket knife. Scared, I tried screaming again. I tried to bite his hand, I tried to do anything to get him off me but to no avail. Scott flipped open the blade. Then he took the knife and slowly traced it down, stopping at my boxer shorts. You kicked me in the balls, he said. It seems only fair I get you back in a similar way. I screamed in his hand some more and tried with all my might to push him off. Fortunately though, he moved the knife away from my boxers. He brought it up to my face He cut a little line down my cheek. I felt the blood spill out as I began crying. Next time, it will be your balls, he said. He then punched me in the face and warned me that if I tell anyone, he would kill me. Well, of course, I told. I mean, anyone who doesn't tell on a bully who has threatened them with a knife needs to have their head examined. He was picked up by the campus police and got turned over to the actual police and expelled from school. I never saw him again, thank God. Or at least not whilst I was awake. I definitely dreamt that night over and over again for years. Number 10 My Graham had this cat for a few years. Obese orange and white tabby kind of just comes and goes kind of cat named Butter. He met with an untimely end, so we buried him in the woods behind the house. One day, we're all having tea and toast, and I walk by his couch and see him sitting there, grooming himself, legs straight up in the air, and I kind of wave at him to swap me and say, Hi, Butters. He stops and gives me that half-eyes-open stare, and goes right back to town grooming. I walk into the kitchen, wait for my toast, and stare at this photo on the fridge of this fuzzball of a kitten, and realize that it is butter, and also that he's been long dead. I slowly turn around and everyone seems to notice, and ask me what's wrong. I tell them what I've seen, and my gram looks somewhat pleased to hear her cat is... Visiting. Number 11. I've told 
quite a few people this story, and almost no one believes me. But it's definitely true, and is the freakiest thing that has ever happened to me. I had a few years where I was sort of down on my luck. I live in an area with a lot of relatives, so one of my aunts was having a party, and I ended up staying a lot later than I should have. There was free beer, so I had to, and I got a bit intoxicated. And when my cousin who was supposed to be driving me home wanted to leave, I declined because I wanted to keep drinking. So he left, and I was without a ride home. When I finally left, I had an extremely long and uncomfortable walk ahead of me. Whilst you might think that my aunt or someone else could have given me a lift home, my family was a little tired of having to drive me places. So, I prepared for a really long walk down this country road. Although I had been drinking, the atmosphere outside sobered me up pretty quickly. It was really dark and very brisk. And for some strange reason, it was eerily quiet. I mean, usually there are all sorts of animal noises. You know, crickets and frogs and other things. But this night, everything was calm and quiet. I did become aware of some noises in the woods though. You know, as if an animal were walking back there. And the noises didn't go away either. Which made me start to think that an animal might be following me. Of course, I was very nervous at this point. I didn't fancy being something's midnight snack, and I tried to hurry up a little bit, and I did get slightly ahead of the noises, so I figured that I'd be okay. However, right then, I heard a sound of several twigs breaking, but the sound stopped there. I had a feeling that whatever had been following me was now directly behind me. But it wasn't moving. I told myself to keep walking. But part of me said I just had to turn around and see. So very slowly, I forced myself to turn around. And when I saw my pursuer, I screamed. There was this large, dark figure standing behind me and it had to be nearly eight feet tall. The worst part though, was that it had red glowing eyes and it stood there staring down at me. Well, I took off running right away and I was so terrified that I didn't even notice if it was following me. I didn't know how far I actually ran and if it followed me at all. But finally, after an eternity, I ventured a look back and saw nothing. It was still eerily quiet, and I was terrified. But I walked the rest of the way home. Now, I know everyone would just tell me that I was drunk and imagined it, but never before has drinking beer caused me to hallucinate. I know what I saw that night, and I never went for a walk in the middle of nowhere again. Number 12 I was living in Tokyo a while, and went through this phase of checking out abandoned places, haunted places, and straight up strange areas. It wasn't long until I was told of Oakigahara Forest. I made my way out there one spring day. I felt like I was being watched from the moment I stepped into the forest. The silence bothered me. There were no birds, no animals, no insect sounds. Just an eerie silence. I didn't notice this until a slight wind rustled the trees at one point, and I realized it was the first thing I had heard in at least 40 minutes. I walked around for maybe three hours total. About an hour and a half in, 
I started to panic. This silence was deafening. I was convinced there were eyes watching me from all around. It felt like the forest was closing in on me, almost tunnel vision-like. I wasn't disorientated, but I felt unstable. I can't really explain it. I saw a tent. It was zip. I didn't want to know what was inside. It was clear it had been there for a while, beaten by storms and blown around a little. There were pieces of clothing I saw here and there. A shoe, a jacket, a hat, all extremely dirty and untouched. The image burned into my brain is a note nailed to a tree which said, I'm sorry, in Japanese. And that was all. I couldn't walk back to the car park quick enough. The whole way thinking this was a terrible idea. The whole way feeling like something was walking one step behind me, almost pushing me out of the forest. Just like the OP, I deleted all my photos. I never want to see that place again. Bad juju among those trees. That was nine years ago. Sometimes I dream of it. It's always a nightmare. Number 13 Believing in make-believe characters, like Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny, can be really fun for children. It lets them believe in magic, where they're at an age where their minds are still capable of such things. You know, before the world of cynicism falls down upon them. But also it can have some bad effects too though. This story isn't very Christmassy, I have to apologise for that right off other than the fact that it takes place on Christmas Eve and has some connections to make-believe characters. It's not really very holiday related. My brother used to tell me that there were all sorts of magical creatures on Christmas and that all of them were good. Elves, for example, helped Santa Claus deliver presents. He told me about reindeer, Frosty the Snowman, you name it. The point being that I believed in magical Christmas creatures, and I believed that they were all good. And yes, I still believed in Santa Claus when I was nine. So I had been put to bed at eight o'clock. All I knew was when I woke up, the house was dark and quiet. So I figured that my entire family had gone to bed. I stretched and decided I should just turn over and go back to bed. When I flipped over, I got startled by something in the corner of my bedroom. It was completely dark over there, so I couldn't see it very well at all. But there were the shadows of some sort of figure hanging out in the corner of my bedroom. It was sitting on the floor, or at least that's all I could make out. But there was definitely something there. My first reaction was to be scared. I mean, any young child seeing a shadowy figure in their bedroom in the middle of the night would be scared, right? But then I remembered that it was Christmas Eve. Likely early Christmas morning by the time I'd woken up. So it made sense to me that whatever I saw was likely one of Santa's helpers. He was probably watching over me to make sure that I was asleep. I mean, Santa only brings presents to kids that are asleep right? It was then that the shadowy figure in the corner stood up. It was by standing up that I was completely positive that there was definitely something in my room. When it stood up, I quickly turned around and told the shadow that I was sorry and that I would go to sleep. I had my head against my pillow for a few minutes, holding my eyes closed as tightly as I could. I was afraid that if I opened them, Santa Claus would leave. Whilst I was laying there, I heard some footsteps approach my bed. All was silent for a few minutes or so, and then I heard the footsteps lead the room. I eventually fell asleep, and everything was fine on Christmas morning in our house. However, at one point during the day, the police came and knocked on our door. 
it turned out that there had been several break-ins in the neighbourhood and they were just checking with everyone to see if they had witnessed anything. I never forgot that. When I got older I started wondering if maybe someone had broken into the house. If so, was that them in my room? And if so, why hadn't they stolen anything? I knew I had seen something and heard something. I was just never able to figure out what it was or why it was there. Number 14 Back in 03, I took my kids to Europe for a vacation. One of our stops was in Pisa, Italy, where we stayed in an old monastery that had been turned into a hostel. That night, we all slept in a dorm room, but since it was off-season, we were the only ones in it. We had three separate beds that were right next to each other, and in the middle of the night, I distinctly felt a cat jump up on my bed and lay on my legs. It woke me up. So I looked to see the cat and there wasn't one. Positive of what I felt, I tried to ignore it. So I lay back down to go to sleep, not wanting to get all freaked out about it. The next morning I mentioned it to my kids and my daughter, who's 15, said that the same thing had happened to her last night. That's the only time something like this has happened to me, and I am glad it happened to her too to back up my story. Number 15 When I was in elementary school, there was a nice janitor that I really liked. Most of the kids made fun of him actually, but I was never sure why. They told stories about him, and claimed that he was mentally retarded or that he had escaped from the crazy house. I think it was just because he seemed a little off to them. He was quiet and never responded when any of the other students would talk to him and would sometimes stare at people quite blankly. I was the type of kid, however, that hated to see people sad. I hated to see people get picked on. So one day, when I saw how sad the janitor looked, I decided to do something nice for him. I went out during recess, picked a couple of daisies, and brought them into the school and gave them to him. He took them and I actually saw the man smile for the very first time. I also heard him speak for the very first time when he said thank you. After that, for a couple of weeks, the janitor seemed a lot different than before. He smiled whenever he saw me. He would say, Hi Jenny and would always say hi right back to him. Some of the other kids made fun of me for talking to him, and joked that the retarded janitor had a crush on me. I just ignored them though. People saying mean things never really bother me all that much. A few weeks after I had the first talk with the janitor, I bought him some more flowers from the schoolyard. This time when I handed them to him he thanked me, and he said something else. Do you want to see where I keep all the daisies you bring me, he asked. I of course nodded and told him yes. I was pretty interested. He then told me to follow him. He led me down to the janitor's closet, which was a bit down the hall. He opened the door and turned on the light. I had given him a lot of flowers over the past five or six weeks, and it seemed like every single one of them was in there. He also had my school picture, who knows how he got it, hanging up on the wall by the vase that was overstuffed with dying flowers. For the first time, I was a bit concerned about the guy. Before I could even talk to him, the janitor grabbed me and pushed me into the room. I fell down on my knees. He then flicked the light off for some reason and closed the door. I heard it lock from the outside. I panicked like any ten-year-old girl would in that situation. I began screaming and crying at the top of my lungs. I ran over to the door and began pounding on it with my fists and kicking it with my feet. Tears flowed down my face. The only fortunate thing was that I was really too young to have any idea what he probably wanted from me. 
It was likely that I was only closed in the closet for a few minutes, but it seemed like forever. I eventually heard the key in the door, and the janitor opened it. Right beside him was the school principal and the gym teacher. Apparently a few kids saw him shove me in the closet and ran to get the principal. He took me by the hand and said that he would take me to the nurse's office to call my parents, and the gym teacher had the janitor by the collar and was told to take him to the principal's office and call the police. I was okay. My mum and dad were so pissed though, they demanded that the man be fired and put in jail. He obviously was fired, as I never saw him again, but I have no idea if he even went to jail. To this day, my parents will not tell me anything else about the incident. Number 16. So as a kid around 11 or 12, I had the world on my fucking plate. We had these woods around us that I never ever came close to finding the edge of. I would wake up in the morning, early, when school was out, and my friend Alex and I would spend the whole day out mucking around those woods. We would pack sandwiches and sodas and just go nuts, play army and war, Cowboys and Indians, you name it. This being the 80s, and Alex and I being smart enough kids, my parents had no problem with this, and enjoyed taking us to the army surplus store to buy stuff like MREs, and survival knives, and camping gear. It was pretty regular that we would be allowed to stay out overnight, if my dad was there to help us set up camp close to the property. So not on an overnight, but out and about one day, we found a tree house in a part of the woods we had never been to before. Probably about a two hour trek from the edge of the neighborhood. Maybe two miles or three. It was hilly and rocky. Seriously a kid's dream. This tree house was probably 30 feet off the ground, but it looked solid. We were so stoked to find our new castle. We hightailed it back home to get some rope and my pop takes us down to the surplus store, and over dinner, Alex and I can't shut up about it. Next day comes, and we hike out at almost dawn. We got a backpack full of rope and sandwiches, and our knives on our hips, an excitement that's so thick we could chew on it. We make it out there and start attaching rungs made from big sticks onto one end of the rope. It took us a few good hours, but we got one side finished, and the rope tossed over the branch. That's where the little deck and door are. We finally climbed up, and are sitting on the deck looking out, and rock, paper, scissors for who gets to go in first. Alex wins and goes in, and comes right out. He's white as a sheet, and wants to go home. So curious as I am, I go inside. This treehouse is probably 8 foot by 8 foot, and about 7-8 feet high inside. The inside walls are covered, every single inch of naked girls. Not awesome found playboy porn, but kitty porn. I think the oldest kids were about my age, but it was Polaroids and glossy magazine pages. Stuck perfectly up with staples and filling the walls up. Exit Alex and I getting back home as quick as we could. We informed my pops about it, and he calls the cops. The officer shows up and asks us a few questions like where it is, how did we get up there, where did we buy the rope, did we take any pictures off the wall? He got increasingly rude about it, and my pops put an end to it. He left with our statement and said he would be in touch. We were no longer allowed to take overnights in the woods, or be out there for more than an hour without checking in. We actually built a really long tin can phone with the permission of my parents, which allowed us a bit more of our freedom, but we were pretty cut off from the deep exploring. About a year or two later, that same cop stopped me when I was hanging out in a different park, saw me smoking, and caught me with the joint. Alex asked him whatever happened with the treehouse. The cop told us to not do drugs and left us alone. In college, many, many moons later, Alex sent me an email, saying how he read in the big state paper, Towns that are, say, the county seat have their own papers, 
but the capital city has the big paper. That the officer shot himself with his service revolver after his wife found out he was circulating kitty porn. So it comes to my mind like it came to Alex's that we had found his little CP stash cave. And the creepy part came a few months later when Alex sent me another email saying that he went to the estate auction and one of the items for sale was a rope ladder with a bag. Creepiest story I've found in the woods I have, folks. Still grosses me out and sends chills. Number 17 Many years ago, when I met my ex, her family and her lived in a mobile home. My ex has this younger sister who is a bit messed up, in and out of sight wards, etc. So, my ex and her younger sister shared a small room in the mobile home. And whilst we were dating, and before my son was born, she told me the story about how her younger sister would wake up and talk to the man in the hallway. The man always had a suitcase and wore a brimmed hat. My ex and her family always dismissed them as, well, your younger sister is just a bit nuts. Flash forward a few years. My ex and I have a son together. Her parents moved out of the mobile home and into a house and were renting the mobile home to my ex. Our son's room was the exact same room where my ex and her sister slept in. One night after our son had gone to bed and had been asleep for a while, I went to check on him. We heard him get out of bed and we figured that he'd come out of his room to ask us to use the potty. Instead, he started talking to someone. He said hi and started talking about his favourite stuffed animals. At the time, it was a ducky. Curious, I called back and asked him who he was talking to. He pops his head out of the room and informs me he's talking to a man with a suitcase who was wearing a hat. At the time, he was about two and a half and no one had ever told him about his auntie seeing the same guy. Number 18 My friend and I, both girls, live in a rural farming community in northwestern Tennessee. We've always been interested in exploring abandoned places, and the area we lived in was full of them. Old houses, churches, schools, factories, etc. One such factory was an old pajama factory in a very small town that I had kind of grown up in. I was too chicken to explore it by myself when I was younger, and the friends I had had at the time weren't interested. When I got into high school and met my current best friend, though, we decided to take a look. The place is extremely run down with the roof caving in, overgrown and just kind of gross in the office parts of the building where the carpet had essentially turned into a moldy, gelatinous mush. The front door to the main building were glass and had been broken out, so we slipped through easily. I remember taking a tour of the building for school when I was younger, and I remember the office building feeling so nice and homey. It didn't feel like that anymore, obviously. We are exploring the darkened hallways. Ceiling tiles have fallen, and the wood panel on the wall is sliding off, warped and rotting. The floor squelched under our feet, and so far, it was only mildly intimidating. We found old computers and papers. I even took a roll of big sticky labels to draw on, and tag things with. Then, we got to the factory-esque part of the building. It was dark, and just felt off in general, like someone was watching us. We both decided to keep going, deciding to try and go through the factory to the large open bay door on the other side of the building. My friend and I crept further into the room when we hear glass shatter. It echoes through the large open space we're in, and a quick look with our flashlights tells us that it wasn't us. Where we were standing was just a large, empty, concrete floor. Nothing around but a few scattered papers. 
and should have bolted right then, but we were stubborn and kept going after stealing ourselves. Mama didn't raise no coward. Still, there's that sense of uneasiness, and with the shattering glass, I'm on high alert. We come upon a hallway that was... odd. The walls looked like they were covered with insulation and white plastic, most of it rotten and tearing away. Some of it was already on the floor. As we step into this hallway, everything within me just screams to run. I look at my friend and she's white as a sheet. I look forward and I find out why. There's a big black figure standing in the room at the end of the hall. Just standing there menacingly. I'm like, it's time to go. And my friend and I take off as fast as our legs can carry us through that factory. I can hear someone screaming. And it sounds like they're saying something. But over the sound of my own breath and the echo of our panicked footsteps, I can't make it out. We find the bay doors, run through them, and literally launch ourselves off of that concrete docking bay into the woods. We only stop for a second, and I can make out the words then. Come to daddy. I'll kill you. We booked it. Haven't been back since. Recently, they demolished the place, and now it's just an empty concrete lot. Not, not the creepiest experience, but that one definitely stuck in my head. We were 17, 18 at the time, and it could have just been some wacko messing with us. But I hate to think what could have happened if we hadn't gotten out of there when we did. Number 19 a few friends and myself were hanging out at my house board one night and started telling stories about things that we've seen or felt to scare each other. My girlfriend at the time, who had lived in the area a little longer than most of us, started telling us about an abandoned mental hospital that was only about a half hour from my house. She told us that somewhere on its grounds were entrances to underground tunnels and rooms that kept some of the buildings and sidewalks warm. We decided to go out and look there for ourselves, and after roaming the halls and rooms for a while, we came across the steps. Once we got to the basement, we found one of the tunnels, so I walk over and shine my flashlight down the hall to see where it went. The hall was long enough to the point that I couldn't see the end of it, and I could only see blackness. I couldn't see any doorways or even a tunnel that crossed paths with this one. But, as I'm looking down this tunnel, I see this figure kind of slide halfway out of a doorframe. I didn't see it before. It's sitting with its knees up to its chin both its arms resting on its knees overlapping each other. It's skinny like leather over bone and very pale. Its eyes were like softball size and they were glowing this weird yellowish blue colour. At this point, I'm sort of crouched down staring at this thing. I can't even think straight enough to get myself a way out of this hall. And that's when it spoke to me. I'll never forget what it said. Come on. Come on down here and see what we have. Why don't you come on over? Come on. I stood up. I didn't want to, but I took a step forward. Every muscle in my body wanted me to turn around and leave, but I was frozen. As soon as I took that first step, I felt something grab my arm and heard a voice from behind me say, Rah. I left my friends down there, but I ran all the way through the hospital and back to my friend's car. They caught up with me quickly and we raced out the place. We did stop at a white castle before we got home and we found handprints on the back bumper of his rearview window. Needless to say, 
I've never gone back to that place and have no intention of ever doing so. Number 20 I lived a few towns away from a decommissioned World War II hospital that was used up until the 80s. This place was quite far from the nearest town and was right out in the sticks. And when it was decommissioned, they effectively built a wall around the grounds, we're talking like half a mile square, and left it be. There were equipment, cars, beds, personnel records, and fully furnished apartment block for hospital staff. It's like they upped and left one day, leaving everything behind. So a few years back, we had to plan to do a full four-hour expedition under cover of darkness. We park up at a pub 1.5 miles away and walk the rest. We managed to scale the wall using a tree, and we were in. The hospital was creepy as hell. Picture two massive parallel corridors that run the entire length of the main hospital with hundreds of rooms on each side. And when standing at one end, you can't see the opposite end. We decided to take the logical approach and start from the top of the corridor and work our way down, having a look in each room as we go. Most rooms are creepy, old, run-down versions of wards and procedure rooms. However, one room, labeled Chapel, was a built-in church. However, unlike the other rooms, this one was burnt out and completely scorched. We stayed for a while, but then moved on. After leaving the chapel, we heard a loud bang come a few rooms up. The source of the bang was from this huge, 15 feet by 15 feet, 5 inch thick iron box. It looked like an oversized safe. The door was heavy and matched the sound we heard, but it took a lot of effort to move so we had no idea how it made the sound without help. We continued on, and re-entered the corridor, however. Looking back from what was once a relatively clear corridor, was now a single wheelchair, right in the middle, facing the door leading to the chapel. Both a little freaked, we start thinking about wrapping up our adventure. However, neither of us wanted to walk past the wheelchair, to get back to the entrance. We decided to cut through to the parallel corridor, go to the end, and cut back through, back to the primary corridor. We reached the entrance again, but before we left, we shone our torch down towards the chapel and noticed the wheelchair was now facing us. My friend at this point was getting very agitated and yelled. However, nothing happened. We go to leave, and we both hear a whimper coming from the corridor. We ran so fast and got back to the car at ASAP. We initially thought it was someone screwing with us, but the amount of sound that echoed around when walking and the debris on the floor exacerbating the sound. We are sure we would have heard anybody moving in such close proximity to us. We went back during daylight a couple of days late, and couldn't find a single wheelchair in the main corridor, or any room connected to it. We did find a room full of them, on the opposite side of the hospital. It was the oddest thing. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. That's my third compilation in the last few days, and I really hope that you guys have enjoyed them all. You all requested longer videos, so here you are. If you enjoyed the video, I'd really appreciate a big thumbs up as it really helps me out. And don't forget to tell me what you thought of the video in the comments section, and if you guys want more longer videos in future. Remember that if you've had a creepy or paranormal experience that you wish to share, Feel free to send it to my email which you can find in the description. You can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter at The Mortis Media for some secret stuff you won't find anywhere else. 
I'd just like to thank you guys so much for all the support you've given me and your continued viewership. Your continued support is what lets me keep making the content for you guys, and I'm so grateful for it. So honestly, thank you so much. You all mean the world to me. But anyway guys, for now, I'm going to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.